understanding ACI inter-VRF contracts. What is an inter-VRF contract? As the name implies, an inter-VRF contract is a contract between EPGs that are on different VRFs. There are multiple options that fall into the same category. You could have an EPG to EPG contract, as the as this slide shows. You could have a lay three out an EPG contract with lay three out in a VRF different than EPG, or you could have a lay three out to a lay three out contract with two lay three outs in different VRFs. All of these fall into the same uh, category that is covered by this presentation. So, what is necessary uh, to achieve correct forwarding and traffic filtering? for traffic between two VRFs, you need to have in place route leaking and the policy cam correctly programmed. So uh, the necessary configurations compared to a regular EPG to PG configuration are the scope of the contract. So the contract scope must be set to tenant or global or even application profile, which is mm, not used as often as tenant or global but it cannot be VRF. The scope of the contract set to VRF prevents this configuration from working because it says that that contract should be used within the same VRF. If you want two EPGs of the same tenant under two different VRFs to talk, if the two EPGs are in the same application profile, you could set the scope to application profile. Otherwise, you set it to tenant and this will work. If the EPGs are in different tenants, then you should set the scope to be global. So that's the first thing. The second one is you need to have VRF route leaking. So the subnet that you see here must be routable from VRF2, and the subnet you see here should be routable from VRF1. Uh, to do that under the consumer side BD, you need to set the subnet to be shared. Under the provider side, instead, you need to add a configuration under the EPGs, and you need to enter the subnet under the EPG with the shared option checked. This is slightly different than the usual EPG configuration in that you're not supposed to put a sub under the EPG normally, but there are reasons that you will understand in a few slides why you would need a subnet under the provider side EPG. Now, this subnet doesn't have to match the BD subnet. It has to be either the same specificity or more specific uh, than the BD subnet. Now, if you put the exact same subnet as the BD, then you cannot have another EPG on the same BD uh, because all the endpoints must be under EPG web. So if you need to segment BD2 into more EPGs, then you need to come up with a way to divide the BD subnet into more specific subnets and assign those more specific subnets to the EPGs. So back to the main explanation, you need to have the subnet configure on the PG, a set with shared option, then you should disable the gateway functionality for this subnet under the PG. Or in other words, you need to select this option called no default gateway SVI for the EPG. This option means that the default gateway is provided by the BD and not by the EPG. So it's not mandatory that you do this, but we recommend you do this and you use the full gateway provided by the BD instead of this one. So to summarize, contract set to scope tenant or global, a BD subnet in the consumer BD set to shared, and the EPG in the provider BD configured with a subnet with a shared option and not the full gateway SVI. So these are the only differences between an inter-VRF configuration and a normal EPG to EPG intra-VRF configuration. This gives you more details about why there is the need to enter a subnet under the provider side EPG. The reason is that ACI optimizes the traffic filtering for EPG to EPG contracts to be on the consumer side VRF. So what needs to happen is that ACI needs to program the information about VRF2 into VRF1. And the way that information is provided is by the fact that the administrator enters which IP address range is under a given EPG on the provider side. And that is programmed then in the consumer side VRF. 
notice also that there is this number. It's the class ID number. It's a number that identifies CPGs in hardware. And there are different ranges. This number belongs to the local range, so it could be reused in different VRFs because it's local. This number is a global number, so this number uniquely identifies this EPG regardless of which VRF you're looking at. Okay. So what happens is that as soon as you enter and as soon as you make this the provider EPG for a provider side VRF and you enter the subnet, this EPG gets a global class ID. And the forwarding rules in VRF1 say that this EPG can send traffic to this destination class ID and vice versa. Um, and it's programmed in the consumer side VRF. Now, you would wonder then why these optimizations are in place. Well, the reason is because it's more efficient programming of the hardware if you want. It's a design choice that was made uh, from the very beginning. Because then on the provider side VRF, there's only one forwarding rule that says that traffic from a global class ID to any other VRF is allowed. And then the filtering happens on the um, consumer side VRF. This is how the forwarding is implemented. Let's talk about lay three out to EPG configurations. Uh, compared to a regular A3 Auto PG configuration, the main difference for InterVRF is that under the A3 outside configuration, under the network, or other, in other words, under the A3 external, uh, you need to set these flags, shared route control import subnet and shared security import subnet. Otherwise, the other configurations are the ones you already know for um, InterVRF contracts. So the scope must be tenant or global. And the um, provider side EPG must be set um, with the subnet and the shared and not the full gateway SVI. Okay, these are the main differences. Now, uh, just these are some additional details. If you want to know more about how the hardware is implemented, is implementing the filtering and the forwarding. With VRF sharing, you need to distinguish two modes of policy filtering. For EPG to EPG contracts and for the layer 3 out to EPG contracts with the layer 3 out as provider, the enforcement happens in the consumer side VRF. So all the previous uh, description applies. If instead the contract is between two layer 3 outs or between a layer 3 out and an EPG with the layer 3 out as a consumer, then the enforcement is not necessarily happening in the consumer VRF. It's instead happening on the ingress leaf, okay? And that is reflected in the programming uh, of the hardware, as you can see on the column here to the right, because if the layer 3 out is a provider, the programming is what we already described a few slides ago. It's the, provide, the consumer side, this consumer side VRF that has all the rules. If instead the layer 3 out is a consumer, the layer 3 out prefix and the class ID is not just in the consumer side VRF, but also in the provider side VRF. And the optimization here is about filtering on the ingress leaf. So two different forwarding approaches that when you configure the inter VRF filtering, you don't need to know about, but this is just for you to know how, how it works.